is God's Word. So uh, let's dig into God's Word now, shall we? We're going to look at Hebrews chapter 1, and we're going to read from verse 1 through to verse 14, and the, and the words are on the screen. So Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 through to 14. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom he also made the universe. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purifications for sin, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. So he became as, as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. For to which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son, today I have become your father. Or again, I will be his father and he will be my son. And again, when God brings his firstborn into the world, he says, Let all God's angels worship him. In speaking of the angels, he says he makes his angels spirits and his servants flames of fire. But about the sun, he says, your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. A scepter of justice will be the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God has set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. He also says, in the beginning, Lord, you laid the foundations of the earth and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment. You will roll them up like a robe. Like a garment, they will be changed. But you remain the same, and your years will never end. To which the angels did God ever say, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Are not all the angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation and pray that god will open up his word uh, in a few moments time wayne do you want to come and join me I'll, it's uh, i did sort of give wayne a bit of a heads up we'll we'll say a prayer for him before uh, before uh, he opens god's word do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself i had a, a one minute soundbite about your, your life didn't i just before yes. the service but do you want to tell us a bit about yourself where you're from not the whole history but you know yeah. a little bit so we so we know who you are and okay. uh, yeah. the background Behind, yeah uh, well good morning everyone it's uh, it's a, a joy to be with you uh, this morning, and uh, I trust God will continue to bless uh, our time together as we worship him, as we hear his word. Um, yeah, I, I live in Krakowell. I'm, I'm here this morning with Deborah, my wife, and um, what more can I say to that? Um, actually, oh yeah, um, I've got a Yorkshire accent, but um, I was actually born uh, just outside of Newport, um, and um, I actually live in Swansea, went to school in Swansea, but uh, we moved up to Yorkshire at a young age, so... Um, I've now got a Yorkshire accent, so, um, and uh, yeah, I've been a Christian now for many years, um, we moved to Wolverhampton in the 80s, and um, I became a Christian there under the ministry of Gareth, Gareth Crosley, and um, yeah, I thank God for his saving grace to me and, and to you in, in Christ, and uh, yeah, praise him. Brilliant. You're only in Yorkshire for a fortnight, I understand, but you gather the accent pretty quickly. Uh, yes, but, uh, yes. But, uh, right. no, let's, let's, let's just pray for you now and pray for us as we receive the word. So, uh, Father God, we thank you for Wayne. Uh, we thank you for Deborah as well. Lord, we thank you for their faith. We thank you that they're so willing to live out their faith and for Wayne to open up your word. Uh, we, we pray, Lord, you'll be with him now, that you would have been with him in this preparation, that he would see, first of all, uh, your, your word and, and what it means to him what it means at the time it was written, but also how it, uh, how it is supposed to be lived out and received in our lives now. Your word is timeless. Your word is eternal. And we pray, Lord, as Wayne digs into it now, as we receive it, you'll unblock our ears. You'll draw our hearts closer to your word, and you'll give us the strength to live it out with Jesus at the center of our lives. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Thank you Mark. I should also say that um, I bring the, the greetings of the church at Crick Owl, at Christ Church Crick Owl. We used to be um, Crick Owl Evangelical Church up till um, 18 months or so ago, and uh, we then decided to change the name so that um, uh, the church name actually said what it does on the, on the tin, as it were, Christ Church. So uh, 
we're now Christchurch at Crick Hall. So uh, I do bring uh, the greetings, and I know one or two of you do know some of the folk at Crick Hall, so uh, I know they'd want me to pass uh, their love on to you as, as well. Now, some years ago, uh, an American swimmer, Florence Chadwick, set about swimming the 26 miles between the, the Californian coastline and an island called Catalina. As she swam, uh, a small team of people were in a boat alongside her, and they were there to support her if she got into any difficulties like fatigue or became um, endangered in her life. Uh, after all, these were shark-infested waters, and uh, one or two might have been feeling a bit peckish that day. So um, the team were there to help support her. Roughly into uh, 15 hours of her swim, a, uh, a thick sea fog came rolling in, which um, clouded Florence's vision and uh, hindered her confidence to continue. It knocked her confidence. She told the team that she didn't think that she would finish the swim, but she continued for another hour. But unfortunately, the fog did not lift. If anything, it got that bit thicker. After 16 hours, 16 hours of swimming, Florence finally decided to call it quits, and she gave up and climbed on board the, the boat. How sad and disappointed Florence must have felt at having to give up on her attempt. It wasn't that she was tired, it wasn't that she wasn't a good swimmer. It was simply down to the fog. The fog had stopped her reaching Catalina. It had clouded her vision and it had knocked her confidence to continue. There are times when, as Christians, a thick fog can roll over us. Fog so dense that it clouds our vision and hinders our journey to heaven. Those times when trials and troubles come upon us, when they, they test us, times when we don't see Jesus clearly and uh, we wrongly feel that God is far from us. Times when perhaps we feel like throwing in the towel. The book of Hebrews was written to Christians who were experiencing such difficulties, who were not seeing Jesus clearly, and who were in danger of giving up. For any uh, who is finding life a struggle uh, this morning, or any who may feel discouraged, Hebrews is a book that helps us keep the right perspective. It's a book that helps us to keep our heart and our mind fixed on the Lord Jesus. So, as none of us are immune from the trials and difficulties of life, I thought this morning it might be helpful if we looked together at the first four verses of Hebrews chapter 1. These verses which hopefully we can draw encouragement from and help us to live to the glory of God. It's believed by uh, many scholars that uh, Hebrews was written in the, the latter part of the first century, about 30 to 40 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus. The original readers were mainly Jews who had converted to Christianity. They had left the ways of the Old Covenant and have turned to Jesus and the New Covenant in his name. But because of their faith in him, they are facing great persecution and even imprisonment for their faith. Make, make no mistake, this was really difficult times for these Jewish Christians. These were really hard times for them. And whether through persecution or simply through um, a lack of faith, it would appear that many were in danger of turning away and returning to Judaism. They are no longer seeing Jesus clearly and they are wavering in their faith. There's the, the danger of them giving up. With this in mind, Hebrews is written to encourage these Christians, to challenge them to persevere in Jesus, to continue living for him, to run, as we read in chapter 12, to run with perseverance the race marked out for them, with their eyes firmly fixed on him. And so, 
with this view of encouraging his readers to continue living for Jesus, the writer sets about showing Jesus' superiority. He is far better than anyone or anything else. And the, the writer does this by comparing and contrasting uh, Jesus with key people in the, uh, in the key events of Israel's history, with key people and key events. These uh, Jewish converts would have had a, a thorough knowledge of the Old Testament scriptures. They would be well versed in the Old Covenant of Moses and in Israel's past. So the writer makes to look it clear that Jesus, this, uh, this saviour of the world, the one who fulfills all the Old Testament prophecies about the promised Messiah, that he is far better than anyone or anything in Israel's history. He is superior to the, the pictures and types and to all the representations and shadows that have preceded him. Following Jesus is the right commitment to make. Why would anyone want to return to the old covenant of Moses when they have the new and the better covenant in Jesus' name? The new covenant in him is the only way forward. For any this morning going through uh, difficult times who may be finding things tough and um, hard going, hopefully, uh, by God's grace, you will, um, you will find encouragement in these words of Hebrews. And for any who are yet to turn to Jesus, may God help you see that following him is indeed the right commitment to make. In verses 1 to 3, we have uh, what's been described as probably the most concise and comprehensive New Testament statement of the superiority of Jesus. These uh, three verses are not only an, induction, uh, an introduction to the book, but they are also a, a summary of the book. And in this summary, we see who Jesus truly is. In them, we see the, the preparation for Jesus. We see the presentation of Jesus. And we see the preeminence or the superiority of Jesus. Hebrews begins uh, with reference to the Old Testament. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. The Old Testament focuses on the preparation for Jesus' coming. From Genesis 3.15, uh, the first pointed to Jesus and to the gospel, right through to, to Malachi, where we have the, uh, the reference to his return in judgment. Jesus is the focus. And the Old Testament is full of prophecies about a promised Savior. Prophecies which only Jesus could and would fulfill. Prophecies like those found in Isaiah and Micah about uh, the Savior's birth, that he will be born in the town of Bethlehem, and that he'll be born to a virgin. Jesus is the one pictured in all the sacrifices and ceremonies found in the first five books of Moses from Genesis to Deuteronomy. He is the great prophet, priest, and king promised time and time again. Before Jesus became flesh, God spoke to the people through his prophets. Men like Elijah, Isaiah, and Jeremiah. And of course, there were the women prophets like Deborah and Huldah and Miriam. God had spoken at different times and in various ways. He had spoken through dreams and visions. He had spoken through mighty actions and appearances. He had spoken through commands and promises. But these have been in segments, recorded at different times and in different books of the Old Testament. None of these books present an entire picture of the Savior. We get a partial view here and a, and a partial insight there. Whilst the Old Testament prepared its readers for the coming Savior, the complete picture was only found, or is only seen in the coming of Jesus in the new. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But, verse 1 continues, 
But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. Here we have the, the presentation of Jesus, the son of God. And he's, he's presented by way of contrasts. Contrasts aimed at showing his superiority. And the superiority of the new covenant over the old. In the past, God has spoken through various prophets. But in contrast, he now speaks through just one. Through just one, his son. God has spoken at different times and in various ways. But in contrast, God has now spoken his final and definitive word through his son. In the Old Testament, God spoke through men and women who were by nature sinners. In contrast, in these last days, he has spoken through his sinless son, the one who is the ultimate prophet, the one whom the original readers of the book of Hebrews must listen to, the one to whom we also must listen if we are to be in a, a right relationship with God. At the, uh, the transfiguration of Jesus, that time when on the mountain uh, with Moses and Elijah, Jesus' face shone like the sun and his clothes became as white as snow. At the transfiguration, the father said to the son, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Do you remember what God said next? Listen to him. Listen to him. This is my son whom I love. In him I am well pleased. Listen to him. God was saying to the world, this is the one you must listen to. This is the one who has the words of eternal life. Now, um, I don't know whether you like to tune into the, uh, the king's TV speech on Christmas Day. Apparently for the, the last two Christmases, uh, King Charles' address to the nation has been the most watched program on TV on Christmas Day. His first Christmas message in uh, 2022 had more people tuning in than the Queen had for any of her TV Christmas messages going back to 1957. While so Whilst for so many, it's um, important to listen to what the king of the nation has to say. How much more important, how much more urgent is it that we listen to the one who is king and lord over all? The one who is king of kings and lord of lords. Jesus Christ, the son of God. Are we, and, uh, and I ask these uh, questions of myself... Are we consistently hearing God's word preached? Are we in the habit of reading our Bibles and reflecting upon what we have read? Are we hearing and listening in the sense of applying God's word to our lives? We need God's word for its teaching and for its training. We need it for its encouragement and for its uh, correcting God has spoken through his son, and we really should listen. Now, once the, the writer um, of Hebrews presents Jesus as God's son, he continues by giving a, a summary of the preeminence or the superiority of Jesus. He looks to show that Jesus is far greater than anyone or anything that has gone before him. He is the ultimate prophet, priest, and king. Verse 2 continues, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom also he made the universe. The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. These words summarize the person and the work of Jesus. They summarize what is so unique and so special about him and what makes him superior to anyone or to anything else. And the first aspect of Jesus' superiority concerns his inheritance. God has appointed Jesus heir of all things. He has planned that Jesus will 
inherit all things. He will inherit all that God has. In the Old Testament, the, the psalmist had said that this would happen. In Psalm 2, we read, You are my son. Today I have become your father. I will make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession. Everything in creation, whether material in the material world or the spiritual world, everything that God has ever created belongs to Jesus. Going back to, uh, to King Charles, one day his son, Prince William, will inherit the, uh, the throne and the status and the authority that goes with it. But Jesus, the Son of God, will one day inherit the entire universe. All that exists will belong to him. And everyone, without exception, will bow before him in heaven and in earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. A further aspect of Jesus' superiority is his power in creation. Through him, God also made the universe. Through Jesus, God created the entire universe. The, the universe that Jesus inherits is the universe that he was instrumental in creating. Quoting from Colossians, For him, in him all things were created. Things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or powers, our rulers, our authorities, all things have been created for him and through him. And John writes, through him all things were made, without him nothing was made that has been made. Now, uh, I'm no expert uh, in Greek, I'm, I'm just thankful to have a, a grasp of the English language. But apparently the word universe in verse 2 means the ages, the, the ages. Genesis 1.14 tells us one of the reasons why God created the stars and the planets was for them to be signs to mark the passages of time, to mark the ages. If we just consider the moon, it does exactly that. It continually orbits the earth every month with clockwork precision. Jesus not only made the universe he also created everything that goes with it, including time and order. I mentioned the moon. How about the, about the sun, this, uh, this continual burning mass that gives light and warmth to the earth? If it was hollow, the sun could hold over a million earths. That's some size. It's a truly amazing size. And yet, uh, as Isaiah points out, it wasn't difficult for God to create. You have made the heavens and the earth by your great power. Nothing is too hard for you, says the prophet. And as for the greatness and the vastness of the universe, with its hundreds of billions of galaxies, how awesome, how great is our God. A third aspect of Jesus' superiority is, uh, verse 3, he is the, the radiance of God's glory. He is the, the radiance, he is the brightness of God's glory. In the Old Testament, the, the glory of God uh, was the visible and an outward sign of God's presence. When God gave the, the law at Sinai, the, uh, the glory of the Lord was present on the mountain. In the desert, when the glory of God entered the tent of meeting, it was a visible sign of God's presence with the people. And when the Ark of the Covenant, this uh, ornate chest which held the stone tablets of the law and uh, over which God spoke to the people. When the Ark was captured by the, the Philistines, the people grieved. But why did they grieve? They did so because the glory had departed from them. God's presence had gone. This same glory says the writer to the Hebrews. This same glory is seen in the person of Jesus. He radiates God's glory because he is God. He is God, the sun. And just as the sun in the sky gives light and warmth, so too the light of Jesus radiates and it shines in the hearts of people. 
I am the light of the world, he says. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Without Jesus, we live in the moral darkness of our sins. A darkness in which we are lost. Without hope of finding peace in this world or of finding peace in the world to come. But he came as light. He came as brightness, the brightness of God's glory to bring us out of that darkness. He came to be the saviour of the world so that whoever believes in him shall not perish but shall have eternal life. And not only is Jesus the, uh, the brightness of God's glory, he is also the exact image of God. His nature is exactly the same as God's nature. And this is another aspect of his superiority. He is exactly like the Father. Now, the, the word representation in verse 3 means uh, to engrave. If you imagine a, a wax seal that you were you seal an, an important letter or document with. The wax is first heated and then poured over the seal of the envelope. And then the stamp which bears the initials or the crest of the person sending is stamped on that wax. The initials or the crest left on the wax is exactly the same initials or crest that's found on the stamp. It's, it's the exact image. Jesus is the exact image of God. In all his character, in all his nature, in all his abilities, the Son is exactly like the Father. God is perfectly, perfectly revealed in and through him. He gives a clear picture of uh, the nature of God because Jesus is God. If you want to see God, look at Jesus, the exact image of the Father. Jesus even says, anyone who has seen me, has seen the Father. And what's more, not only have all things uh, been created through him and for him, Jesus also upholds, he upholds all that he has created. He sustains all things by his powerful word. Going back to the, uh, the sun and, uh, and the moon, if the earth's orbit around the sun was uh, increased or decreased to the slightest amount, we would either freeze or we would fry. If the moon's orbit around the earth weakened, the ocean tides would greatly increase, causing total havoc, far, far worse than any tsunami. Jesus prevents such disasters happening by perfectly maintaining the universe's intricate balance. He ensures the universe is a cosmos and not a chaos. He controls everything from the greatest galaxy to the smallest part that forms an atom. He sustains all things by his powerful word. And by talking about Jesus' work in the universe, the writer to the Hebrews wants his readers to see that Jesus is equal with God, that he is God, that he is the Son of God. And only Almighty God, as every Jew, passionately believed. Only God could keep the planets in orbit by his word of authority and power. Because of his great power and mighty strength, says Isaiah, in reference to God and the stars. Because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. If the uh, original readers of uh, this letter those who were wavering in their faith. If they saw Jesus for who he truly is, if they looked upon him in adoration, then surely the writer is thinking they would not waver in their faith. I wonder, is there the danger, and again, I, um, I challenge myself with this thought, is there the danger that we don't see Jesus clearly enough, that we, we limit our vision of him, that uh, our thoughts of him are nowhere near as great as they should be. Perhaps we, we need to pray the prayer of Richard of Chichester, the, the 13th century bishop. May I know thee more clearly. 
love thee more dearly and follow thee more nearly day by day. And if or whenever your faith is wavering, remind yourself of who Jesus truly is. He is God. He is the eternal son of the living God. God the Father has appointed him heir over all things. Through him the universe was made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. He is the very brightness of God's glory and the exact image of his being. And he upholds all things day and night by his powerful word. And verse 3 continues. After Jesus had provided purification for sins. Uh, at this point, uh, the, the writer to the Hebrews turns our attention from whom Jesus is to what he has accomplished through his earthly ministry. The one who created the, the universe, the one who's made us, didn't remain outside of his creation. He didn't remain distant to it. Instead, the Son of God became one of us. In the words of the carol, he came down to earth from heaven, who is God and Lord of all. And he became one of us to save us from ourselves. Jesus became flesh in order to save us from our sins and the consequences of our sin. Death and eternal separation from God's love and from God's mercy. Because he lived a perfect, sinless life, Jesus was able to take the punishment of our sins. Instead of us being punished, he took our punishment. And he paid the price of our sin in full by laying down his life on a cross. The Old Testament sacrifices repeated over and over again could never remove the sins of the people. These sacrifices pointed to the, the desperate need for a, a once and for all sacrifice, one that would finally take away sins. And God provided such a sacrifice, a superior sacrifice, the ultimate sacrifice in the person of Jesus who came not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. The, the, the writer to the Hebrews con to, uh, concludes his summary of the superiority of Jesus by drawing his reader's attention to Jesus' exalted position in heaven. Again, in verse 3, we read, After Jesus had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. Three days after his death, Jesus rose from the grave, and 40 days later, he ascended into heaven to sit at the right hand of the Father to sit in the elevated position that the Father had given him, at the right-hand side of the majesty in heaven. Jesus' earthly ministry was finished to the total satisfaction of God the Father. And notice where Jesus is sat. He's, he sat at the right hand, God's right hand being the symbol of power, of authority, and of superiority. As Peter says in, in 1 Peter 3, Jesus has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. And when Jesus entered heaven, he did what no other priest under the old covenant could do. He sat down. The old covenant priest could never sit down whilst they were ministering in the temple because their work was never complete. Their work was never completed. They had to continually offer sacrifices for their sin and for the sins of the people. But Jesus' earthly work is done. It's complete. He has accomplished the work of redemption uh, through the cross. He has paid the price of sin in full. He has paid it once and for always through his perfect sacrifice, that sacrifice of his sinless self. His earthly ministry is complete. It's appropriate for him to sit down. Jesus, who is superior to the priesthood and sacrifices of the old covenant, is sat at the right hand of the throne of God as our great high priest, the only mediator between God and mankind. 
the only one who's able to save us from sin. And although uh, his person, through his personal work, and through his exalted position in heaven, Jesus became, verse 4, he became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. In uh, the Jews in biblical time esteemed uh, the, the angels greatly. They had great reverence for angels. These messengers of God sent directly by him to minister on his behalf at crucial times. We only have to turn through the, the pages of our Bible to see how wonderfully God has used uh, angels to serve him. After God, after God, the Jews esteemed no one higher than angels. God came first and then the angels. And so the writer to the Hebrews, by saying that Jesus is superior to the angels, that he's inherited a, a superior name to them, he is saying that Jesus is none other than God. And that is why Jesus is superior to the angels, because he is God, come in flesh. For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity dwells, lives in bodily form. Colossians 2 verse 9. Well, in these opening verses of Hebrews, we see the great truths regarding the superiority of Jesus. His inheritance of all things, his work in creation, his nature as God, his atoning death for sinners, and his exalted position in heaven, and his superiority to the angels. Truths which all proclaim the, the true identity and rightful position of Jesus. There is no one superior to him. There's never been and there never will be. Going back to the, the swimmer Florence uh, Chadwick, apparently as she sat in the boat after giving up her attempt to swim the 26 miles to Catalina Island, it became clear that had she continued, she had less than a mile to go. She had swam for over 25 miles, but unknowingly had given up with less than a mile remaining. The fog had clouded her vision and destroyed her confidence to continue. She couldn't see that she was in touching distance of her goal. After the swim, Florence said, I'm not excusing myself, but if I could have seen the land, I might have made it. Let's not let the fog hinder us on our journey to heaven. Whenever we face trials and troubles and we can't see clearly ahead, let's continue to hold fast to Jesus, continually fixing our heart and our mind on him, remembering he is God, he is the son of God, that he is superior to anyone and to anything. And he promises, as we read in Hebrews 13, he promises that he will never leave us or forsake us. These words, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you, found in Hebrews, are taken from Deuteronomy 31 verse 8. Words spoken to Joshua, but which apply to all those who are in Christ. Let me close by reading uh, those words to you. The Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you or forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Do not be discouraged. Following Jesus is indeed the right commitment to make. Never let the devil tell you otherwise. We have a wonderful Savior, and to him be all the glory. Amen.